when I reflect on my personal journey in the study of the JFK assassination, what stands out to me is the course that I taught on this topic for a number of years at the University of Minnesota. It was a semester course in which we had 14 weeks to cover the topic in some detail. The goal of the course was not a crime scene investigation, but the examination of the assassination as an event that changed history. In this regard, a strong emphasis was placed on understanding the Cold War, which my students told me they had heard about. Excuse me, uh, can I ask James, is there a way to fix your audio? What's the matter with my audio? Comes and goes. That was that was better. Your last your last statement was much clearer, James. I don't know whether you adjusted the mic or anything, but uh, that was much better. I don't know what other adjustments I can make. the uh, The settings that I that I have have worked on other Zoom sessions. Uh, so Sound, sounds fine to me now. It's okay yeah, it's now. Clear. It is clearer now. Yeah. Uh, the point I was trying to make is that instead of starting as a crime scene where we're rolling the Zapruder film and with Hiroshima and Nagasaki and proceeded carefully to Eisenhower's farewell address and the military industrial complex in 1960. I experimented with different ways of teaching the Cold War. In one of the sections, the students enjoyed reading Joseph Heller's novel, Catch-22 which was published almost exactly at the time of the Bay of Pigs invasion. We studied the novel and we studied the historical circumstances of the Bay of Pigs. And we saw that JFK was in a catch-22 situation himself. On one occasion, I even brought in a guest speaker who was a veteran of the Bay of Pigs. I also experimented with a number of textbooks for the course and one of the most successful was James Douglas, JFK and the Unspeakable. Yes. Yeah. It's extremely useful as it develops the parallel lives of JFK and Lee Harvey Oswald leading up to the assassination. Douglas is clearly aware of John Armstrong's research on the two Oswalds, but only develops it in places in the book. Another component of the course was viewing Oliver Stone's film, JFK. Typically only one or two of the students in the class had even heard of the film. The viewing leads into an understanding of how a foreign policy shift was occurring over the assassination weekend with regard to Vietnam. I published an article on this topic that appears on Jim DiEugenio's website Kennedys and King. The name of the article is Edmund Gullion, JFK, and the Shaping of a Foreign Policy in Vietnam. In the article, I discuss how due to the ARRB findings, we now know without doubt that JFK had communicated clearly to the generals and the intelligence network that the Kennedy administration would not be engaging in a hot war in Vietnam. My primary goal today is to introduce you to the evidence for the two Oswalds. I was first introduced to John Armstrong's research in 1999 when he gave a conference presentation in Minneapolis. His book, Harvey and Lee, was published in 2003. This is the kind of work that historians love because it's absolutely filled with primary sources. The volume includes an old CD-ROM, which is very useful in providing photographs and documents. And at the end of each chapter, there is a detailed listing of the sources for that chapter. So it is a real treasure trove of primary evidence. Now, in my reading of this really monumental book, I followed along with John. 
but I'm primarily looking at those sources, hundreds, based on voluminous materials that are archived at the Baylor University and may be accessed digitally. By the 1990s and long after the HSC and even Oliver Stone's film, I was very surprised that there was not a single full-scale biography of Oswald that had been published. Norman Mailer's Oswald Tale was published in 1994, yet it only covered Oswald's stay in the Soviet Union. By this time, three decades had passed since the Warren Commission had concluded that Oswald was the lone gunman. Yet why was it that books would continue continue to be published on the life of someone like John Wilkes Booth over a century and a half ago, and yet none on Oswald. Booth was one of the leading interpreters of his day in performing Shakespeare's villain, Richard III. And Booth continues to fascinate scholars who have carefully studied Booth's prompt book for Richard III. By contrast, mainstream scholars will not touch the life of Oswald for a simple reason. In studying Oswald's life, any researcher will come across major contributions. And so the closest we have at this time to a full-scale biography of Oswald is Harvey and Lee. And as it turns out, many of these contradictions are resolved with an understanding of the two Oswalds. An essential starting point is that Oswald was part of a long-term project of the CIA, which was part and parcel of the strategies of both CIA and the KGB. The success of the latter was the incubation of Kim Philby in a top intelligence post at the British MI6. But it took years for him to incubate and to win the trust of both British and American agents, which he betrayed spectacularly. The so-called Oswald Project was another long-term project. It was the careful coordination of planting a Russian-speaking operative in the Soviet Union. And this is the central point to keep in mind for this talk. The plan that was hatched by the CIA was the recruitment of a young immigrant who had likely fled Eastern Europe shortly after World War II. The idea was to merge the identities of two little boys sharing the name of Lee Harvey Oswald. Homes, but the overarching goal was to conceal from the Soviets that an American defector spoke fluent Russian. The goal was to school the KGB into thinking that Oswald was a genuine defector when he arrived in the Soviet Union in 1959. The Warren Commission never penetrated this story. And in the 888 page volume, the large midsection of the Warren report includes over 300 pages aspiring to be a biography of Oswald. In fact, it is a very carefully prepared composite biography of the two Oswalds designed to support the commission's conclusion that, quote, Oswald was moved by an overriding hostility to his environment. He was perpetually dis contented with the world around him. Long before the assassination, he expressed hatred for American society and acted in protest against it. He sought for himself a place in history, a role as a great man who would be recognized as having been advanced in his times, end quote. Marshalling every opportunity to besmirch Oswald's character, the Warren Report must rely on generalizations to support the thesis above. When the truth of the two Oswalds gains widespread recognition, 
the public will finally understand the duplicity involved in manufacturing a biography to hide Oswald's connections with American intelligence. This will expose the key role played by Alan Dulles sitting on the commission. It is for this reason that the government documents will likely never fully be released. The documents still being withheld are likely such mundane um, materials as tax records that would expose the two Oswalds to the intelligence community. Uh, community. Uh, this is indeed an issue of national security. The researcher David Josephs has provided the most detailed timeline of the parallel lives of the two Oswalds. But for the purpose of this brief presentation today, I wanted to offer you a sampling of some of the crucial intersections of the lives of Harvey and Lee. In 1947, in Fort Worth, Texas, the first instance we know of the two Oswalds comes from evidence that identifies an American boy from the Deep South and what was in all likelihood a bilingual immigrant who spoke both Russian and English with the two boys using the same name. In 1947, while the Russian speaking boy resided at 101 San Saba in Fort Worth in the care of a heavy set woman who was a practical nurse and identified herself as Marguerite Oswald, the American boy with the same name was residing at 1505 8th Avenue in Fort Worth with his two brothers and his mother, the real Marguerite Oswald. I drove past the San Saba property, which is still in a remote and sparsely populated area of Fort Worth. In 1947, it was just starting to be developed in the post-war years. It was due to the memory of one of the earliest residents of San Saba, Georgia Bell, that the Oswald Project came to light in its embryonic form. When shown a photograph of the Marguerite Oswald imposter, Mrs. Bell said, that's her, short and fat, just like I remember her. And when shown a photo of the tall, slender Marguerite Oswald standing next to Edwin Ekdahl on their wedding day, taken only two years earlier, Mrs. Bell replied, I don't know who that is. For the next 12 years, a charade unfolded in which there were over 20 combined moves of Marguerite Oswald and her young son, Lee, and those of a second woman and child who answered to the names of Marguerite and Harvey Oswald. Prior to the moment when the identities of the two boys were merged in anticipation of the so-called defection to the Soviet Union, of the Russian-speaking Oswald Harvey in 1959. Multiple eyewitnesses would recognize the differences between the real Marguerite Oswald and her imposter in nearly the same words as Georgia Bell. And this well-conceived plan eventually succeeded in duping the Soviet Union into believing that Oswald was a genuine director, uh, defector. On a research trip to Dallas-Fort Worth, I explored all the known residences of Oswald, and it became clear to me that the constant moving around would often mean that young Oswald would be forced to attend school in a different district, thus making it more difficult for the KGB to track school records at the time of his defection. Another important issue was Marguerite's financial situation. In the early 1940s, she was a widow who was so destitute that she had to place her boys in orphanages. Yet by the late 1940s, her situation had inexplicably turned around so completely that she was now residing in middle-class neighborhoods and was even purchasing properties solely in her name. In July 1947, Marguerite purchased the property at 101 San Saba. 
In August 1948, she purchased a new home at 7408 Ewing in Fort Worth. In November 1951, she purchased a small house at 4833 Birchman in Fort Worth. During the period of 1947 through 51, there were the three purchases of homes and a grand total of six different addresses at which Marguerite was residing. So what does it can explain the change in fortunes of Marguerite? And I'm just talking about the real Marguerite here. There were other addresses, of course, where the Marguerite imposter and the little Russian speaking boy was living as well. The change may be explained by the Oswald Project in allowing the government to use the name of one of her boys for a surrogate Lee Harvey Oswald, as well as her own name that would be shared with another woman. Marguerite Clavery Oswald likely made a Faustian bargain. To a large degree, her life and the lives of her children would be controlled by the government undoubtedly in return for monetary compensation. In 1952, the real Marguerite Oswald moved with her 12-year-old son, Lee, to New York City. In late March, 1953, Dr. Milton Curian was clearing out his office in his last day of work as a psychiatrist for the city of New York. A court case was called to his attention by a probation officer and Dr. Curian agreed to meet with a boy named Lee Harvey Oswald, who is in the waiting room of his office. The child had been a truant remanded to the corrective youth house in spring 1953. The first impression of Dr. Curian was of, quote, a rather thin, short boy, end quote. For Dr. Curian, the boy in his office looked like an abandoned child. The doctor recalled that the preferred choice of names for the boy was Harvey. The boy talked about how one of his brothers would substitute for him in attending classes when he was unwilling or unable to attend. Photoanalyst <clears throat> Jack White showed Dr. Curian the only known New York photo of young Oswald appearing in the Warren Commission exhibits. And the doctor immediately recognized the boy at the Bronx Zoo as the child he met in his office. But when John Pick, Oswald's older stepbrother, was shown the same photo during his Warren Commission testimony, he was unable to recognize it as his stepbrother who was living with him at the time. The evidence suggests that the two boys, one tall for his age, at five foot four and a half, who was Lee, and the other <clears throat> smaller boy, <clears throat> Harvey, was no taller <clears throat> than four foot eight inches. <clears throat> Both boys were living simultaneously in New York, both claiming to be Lee Harvey Oswald. The surviving School and court records were jumbled at the time of the Warren Commission inquest, and for decades, the attempt to understand the New York years <clears throat> has remained murky. But the evidence of the sparse education records and doctor's testimony suggests that there were two Lee Harvey Oswalds in New York in the early 1950s. For the imposter, the preferred use of the name Harvey for the Russian speaking boy was recalled by Dr. Kurian. In the doctor's opinion, the voice of the boy Harvey included no Southern accent, but sounded like, quote, a general population speech, end quote. How was it conceivable that a child who had apparently just moved to New York from the deep South had no detectable Southern accent when both of his brothers spoke with pronounced Southern drawls. The little boy examined by Dr. Curian likely fled to Stanley, North Dakota to escape the New York legal system. Your fellow member, Gary Severson, is a great expert on young Oswald's stay in North Dakota. 
having traveled all over the country to conduct interviews. Perhaps Gary would like to share some of his experience in our discussion section today. This was the boy who subsequently started attending Beauregard Junior High School in New Orleans in fall 1953, at the time that the American-born Lee Oswald was still a student at PS44 in New York City. For the next few years, the Oswald boys were shuttling between New Orleans and Fort Worth. Palmer McBride was a friend of the Russian-speaking Harvey Oswald in New Orleans from fall 1957 through early 1958. But during the same period, Lee Oswald was on active duty in the Marines and was stationed in Atsugi, Japan. In addition to McBride's recall of his friendship with Oswald in 1957 through 58, there is corroborating evidence that Harvey Oswald was living and working in New Orleans from testimony of employees at the Pfister Dental Lab where Oswald worked. There was also a rare production of Mussorgsky's opera Boris Godunov in New Orleans that included performances only on October 10th and 12th, 1957, one of which was attended by Harvey Oswald and his friend Palmer McBride. At that exact time, Marine, Oswald, uh, Marine Records definitively placed Lee Oswald in Atsugi, Japan, where he had arrived on September 12th. To the FBI, McBride recalled that in early 1958, quote, I took Oswald with me to a meeting of the New Orleans Amateur Astronomy Association at the home of Walter Gerke, end quote. The Warren Commission was confronted with a timeline dilemma in the affidavits of Palmer McBride and his friends because their statements conflicted with official Marine records and multiple Marine eyewitnesses who placed Lee Oswald in the Far East during this period. The missteps of the FBI in failing to completely sanitize the record and the Warren Commission's predilection for failing to examine its own evidence are often the linchpins to understanding the story of the two Oswalds. Invariably, the secrets are uncovered in the most mundane eyewitness details, such as the meeting of an astronomy club or a trip to the opera. From 1957 through 59, United States Marine Corps unit diaries and testimony demonstrate that two Oswalds were currently serving in the Marines. Both young men were associating with different groups of Marines. This period was a carefully orchestrated regimen of training and service in similar locations, but with the primary goal of keeping the two men separate. The most critical period comes in late 1958 to early 1959, when the two Oswalds were stationed in Orange County, California. The Warren Commission failed to identify the two distinct bases which were approximately 10 miles apart in Orange County. Instead, the commission uh, selectively focused on interviewing Marines in the smaller Marine base, Mox 9 in Santa Ana for firsthand accounts about Harvey Oswald at the time he was preparing for his apparent defection to the unit, uh, Soviet Union. The Marines called by the Warren Commission recalled an Oswald who took a special interest in Russian language, literature, newspapers, and music. Somehow, Oswald was able to locate Russian books and records, such as Tchaikovsky's Russian War Dance, which he played in his room in Hut 34 in Santa Ana. According to the Marines' testimony, Oswald openly proclaimed his sympathy for the Soviet Union addressed his buddies as comrade and asked his roommate, James Bothello, to call him Oswaldovich. While Oswald was putting on a show for his fellow Marines in Santa Ana, Lee Oswald was keeping a low profile at El Toro. 
this would be the final act of preparation in the drama of the Cold War spy saga that allowed a native speaker of Russia, the Russian language, to masquerade as a defector in fall 1959. At the heart of this Cold War saga is the question of the degree of proficiency of Oswald in the Russian language. The question that has always troubled researchers has been where, when, and how did the high school dropout Oswald learn the Russian language? The evidence points to Oswald's fluency in Russian before he left for the Soviet Union in 1959 then disguising his competency in Russian language during his stay in the U Soviet Union, giving the outward impression that he was struggling to learn the language. The eyewitness accounts of Oswald's skills in Russian during the Soviet stay point to a disconnect between the period he spent in Minsk, where he seemed ignorant of the language, and the times before and after the trip when he spoke fluent Russian. The most obvious explanation for the contradiction is that he was intentionally concealing his Russian language skills from his Soviet hosts because he was an intelligent asset of the United States. As a defector, Oswald could never let the Soviets know that he spoke their language fluently. If his conversational Russian were too good, he would be exposed as a spy. Dennis Ofstein was one of Oswald's co-workers at the graphic arts company, Jaggers Childs Stovall in Dallas in 1962. Ofstein was also a student of Russian language, having studied at the Army's Intensive Language Institute in Monterey, California. Yet, when the two workers conversed in Russian, it was clear that Oswald ran circles around Ofstein to the degree that, Os that Ofstein asked Oswald for tutorials. Ofstein informed the Warren Commission that he believed that Oswald was an agent of the United States while in the Soviet Union. In their workplace, Ofstein would keep pressing Oswald on how he had learned to speak such polished Russian, but Oswald would never give him a direct answer. For the Warren Commission, Ofstein recalled Oswald's detailed account of Soviet military maneuvers during his residency. In his testimony, Ofstein alone provided enough information for an investigation of Oswald's ties to intelligence and the possibility that he was sent to the Soviet Union in 1959, in the capacity of what Ofstein calls an agent of the United States. But with the presence of Alan Dulles on the Warren Commission, Oswald's records in the CIA were effectively screened from the committee. Otherwise, the truth about the two Oswalds and Oswald's close ties to the national security state would have been revealed. Numerous eyewitnesses offer a profile of Oswald's exceptional fluency in Russian, suggesting that he was a native speaker. According to firsthand accounts, Oswald's conversational and idiomatic Russian were so flawless that he could not have reached that level of fluency exclusively from two and a half years in the Soviet Union. There's no evidence of him studying Russian during his formal education in grade school, junior high, and high school as he shuttled around to different public schools in New York, Louisiana, and Texas. When he quits high school shortly after completing the ninth grade, he immediately joined the Marines and had no time to study Russian on his own in those years. In the final analysis, the Warren Commission was never able to determine where or when Oswald learned Russian. On the surface, Oswald was creating his own legend for the locals in Minsk, the disgruntled Marxist sympathizer and defector seeking a utopian future. But the evidence of his fluency in Russian before he left America in 1959 
contradicts his lack of facility in the language during his stay in the Soviet Union. A genuine expatriate seeking, seeking asylum in the USSR would surely express enthusiasm for the native language and would demonstrate a learning curve in his spoken Russian over time. But when John Armstrong traveled to Argentina and spoke with Anna Ziegler in October 1998, he was interviewing an eyewitness who had been in close contact with Oswald during the entire duration of his stay in Minsk from early 1960 through May of 1962. Anna Ziegler recalled that in all the time Oswald spent with her family in his spoken Russian with the family, uh, she recalled, quote, nobody in our family could say anything to him because he spoke Russian so poorly. Dad would translate and we didn't get to know him very well. He and my father would often sit and watch TV or listen to the radio. And my father would always interpret for him at the dinner table, at work, everywhere. By the 1970s, Richard Schweiker came to realize during the church committee deliberations that, quote, everywhere you look with Oswald, there are fingerprints of intelligence, end quote. Oswald's exceptional fluency in Russian is of foremost importance in understanding the purpose of his defection to the Soviet Union. But long before Schweiker's realization of the fingerprints of intelligence, Oswald's Marine roommate in Santa Ana, James Botello, knew that his buddy was not a genuine Marxist. In an interview given to Mark Lane, Botello observed that Oswald was not a communist or Marxist. If he was, I would have taken violent action against him, and so would other Marines in that unit. By the end of the Clay Shaw trial, New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison had reached the conclusion that Oswald was an American patriot, a hero who had served his country in counterintelligence, yet whose character was so besmirched that his legacy was twisted into one of history's villains. The understanding of Oswald's Russian language proficiency helps to demonstrate how accurate Garrison's conclusions were. <clears throat> As a spy, Oswald lived in Minsk from 1959 through 1962, where he observed the operation of a factory, made detailed notes, and brought back impressions of Soviet life. He married, had a child, and then inexplicably decided to return to the United States. Oswald disembarked in Hoboken, New Jersey on June 13th, 1962. The first person who should have greeted a self-professed communist defector was the head of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover. But when Oswald returned to the United States, there was no apparent concern from the FBI. There was no arrest and there was no apparent interrogation. Oswald was awarded a generous repatriation loan from the United States government to cover his travel costs. He and his family were greeted by Spaz Rakin, an agent for the Travelers Aid Society, who was puzzled about how a Cold War defector could possibly re-enter American society with no official scrutiny, clearing customs, and immediately traveling to Texas. Now, up to this point, everything that I have discussed has nothing to do with the JFK assassination. It has nothing to do with it. What I have described is a rather prosaic Cold War saga that would have been inconsequential except for one reason. Following his return to the United States, sometime in late 1962, and into 1963, the, uh, the CIA began to manipulate Oswald using the legend he had created for himself, for the communists, 
for the Soviets as a Marxist sympathizer. The disgruntled Marxist and ex-Marine was the heart of the plan to frame Oswald for the impending assassination of the president in 1963. This phony communist persona made Oswald the perfect patsy, exactly as described by French President Charles de Gaulle as, quote, this communist who really wasn't one, end quote. This is why James Douglas concludes his book with the assertion that both JFK and Oswald were pawns in the carefully crafted plan of the CIA and became collateral damage at the height of the Cold War. Now, I'm sure you all are familiar with the multiple impersonations of Oswald leading up to the assassination, but I wanted to offer you two instances that you might be not quite as familiar with. One takes place in either August or early September 1963 when Harvey Oswald was with his wife and child in Louisiana. At this time, Lee Oswald visited Jack McKeon at his home in San Leon, Texas, off the beaten track, southeast of Houston and due south of Bay Cliff on the Gulf Coast. McKeon had spent time in prison and was currently on probation for gun running activities to Cuba in a scene that could have been the opening of a French farce. McKeon's new wife was dressed in a negligee when there was a knock on the door by two strangers. Mrs. McKeon scurried upstairs and her husband opened the door to what would be a dynamic opening expository line to the farcical play. As McKeon recalled to the House Select Committee on Assassinations, he was greeted with the salutation, well, golly gee, I finally found you. You are McKeon, aren't you? What followed was a fantastically lucrative offer of cash extended to McKeon if he would sell firearms to the two strangers to be used in a revolution they were planning in El Salvador. McKeon did not want his wife to know about his past run-ins with the law as a gun runner, that he had spent time in prison and that he was a personal friend of Fidel Castro. So he frantically ushered the men out of the house, expressing no interest in selling firearms to them. But the two persistent men returned within a half hour and in scene two of the French farce, they not only doubled down on their offer, but they doubled the price, sweetening the pot and offering to pay up to $10,000 for four savage automatic rifles with telescopic sights. Again, McKeon stoically stood his ground and rejected the offer. He even gave helpful advice to the two interlopers to purchase their guns at Sears Roebuck for $35 each. McKeon had the good sense to recognize that an offer seemed, this offer seemed too good to be true, but he never knew the extent to which he may have escaped a notorious place in history due to his instinctual distrust of the visitors. If he had sold the rifles to the man claiming to be Lee Harvey Oswald and his cohort identified as Hernandez, one of the firearms could have been planted on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository on November 22nd and traced back to Castro via Jack McKeon. The evidence would have linked the Patsy Oswald to Cuba in conjunction with his alleged trip to Mexico City and purported visit to the Cuban consulate. The national outrage would have been such that a retali retaliatory invasion of Cuba uh, could have been payback for the assassination. Even today, there are still attempts to tie Castro to the killing of JFK. Robert McKeon was interviewed by the FBI 
during the deliberations of the HSCA, primarily due to his con connections to Castro and the multiple occasions in which he had met Jack Ruby. If the HSCA staff members had carefully studied the movements of Oswald in 1963, they would have learned that Harvey Oswald was in New Orleans with his pregnant wife during the period of August, September, 1963. And it would have been highly improbable that he was the man who met with McKeon 350 miles away on the Gulf Coast of Texas. Armed with that knowledge, the HSCA could have seen a pattern emerging in late summer of 1963 with imposters attempting to lay a false trail of evidence uh, through staged encounters to entrap Harvey Oswald in the net as the scapegoat in the assassination of President Kennedy. On October 3rd and 22nd, respectively, Laura Kittrell interviewed two different men claiming to be Lee Harvey Oswald. As a dedicated civil servant at the Texas Employment Commission in Dallas, Laura Kittrell counseled two men with the same name, seeking to enter the workforce in fall 1963. But when she returned to work on Tuesday, November 26th, following the day of national mourning for President Kennedy, Kittrell discovered that all of the employment records of Oswald had been confiscated by the FBI. She subsequently prepared from memory a 30-page statement for the United States Attorney in Dallas, which was eventually delivered to the Warren Commission by the Secret Service. Kittrell stated that she felt it was her obligation to turn over to the government the information that she had pieced together. But the Warren Commission expressed no interest in Kittrell's story. She subsequently expanded her report to a 90-page manuscript documenting with precision her interactions with two Oswalds. She even wrote to Robert Kennedy about her experience. For Kittrell, the two men she met in fall 1963 were much alike in size, shape, and outline generally, but there was a marked difference between them in bearing and manner. Kittrell had lined up a job for Harvey Oswald as a baggage handler at the Trans-Texas Airways. The position would have paid $100 more per month than the job he eventually took at the Texas School Book Depository through a lead from Ruth Payne. Kittrell's manuscript sheds light on the curious circumstances of Oswald's employment at the TSBD. Above all, it is yet another instance of Oswald being impersonated in the months and days leading up to the assassination. We have now reached a point in time when more and more serious researchers are taking the two Oswalds seriously. Joseph McBride, is an author you may know, who's the author of a memoir, Into the Nightmare. And his most recent book is A Political Truth, The Media and the Assassination of President Kennedy, uh, just released in the past year. And here is what he writes on page 56. The many instances of Oswald being spotted in two places at once aroused some early attention, but were dismissed as coincidence. It has since been proven by John Armstrong through his exhaustive research for Harvey and Lee that two agents were deployed and used as part of a longtime CIA project to blend their identities and provide plausible denial. If we had been allowed to hear from the prisoner at length, instead of only for brief comments in the hallway and at his quickly truncated but suggestive midnight news conference, if he had been allowed to have legal representation, we would have learned about his connections with the CIA as an agent or asset and false defector to the Soviet Union. In terms of McBride's focus on the media, 
an understanding of the two Oswalds demonstrates not only the media's incompetence and negligence in failing to ascertain the truth, it also reveals the complicity of a powerful organization like Time Life to place one of the fabricated backyard photos on the cover of Life magazine long before the Warren Commission had published its findings, thereby incriminating Oswald in the eyes of the public. Evidence about the two Oswalds definitively exposes the Warren Report as a work of propaganda used to posthumously frame the patsy. The manufactured legend of a left-wing extremist, Castro supporter, and Slavophile had served the purposes of the plotters of the assassination of the president. To this day, the false legend of the man named Lee Harvey Oswald has endured as a footnote to the Cold War in what President Kennedy referred to as the long twilight struggle of the 20th century. Any questions or comments? Sorry, um, you can all unmute guys. If you're uh, if you're muted, yes. uh, thanks, James. That was very interesting. Um, I've certainly got some questions, but can I just throw it out to the floor to start with? Sure. Yes. Sorry, uh, I have a question. Uh, there were two Oswalds. Uh, one of them was shot dead in Dallas Police. Where's the other one? The last we really know of the American-born. Lee Oswald is really from the day of the assassination itself. Um, the evidence suggests that as the man shot, ultimately shot by Jack Ruby, was being escorted out of the front of the Texas theater, the imposter, or the, I mean, the, the second Oswald was being taken out the back. Sorry, lost the sound. That's the Lee Oswald that we know of. And then he was last sighted um, in a car uh, shortly there afterwards and perhaps taken and flown away uh, in an obscure um, flight. No other evidence after that, however. Okay, thank you. Isn't there a theory that he became known as Donald P. Norton? A theory that he became what? Donald P. Norton. I'm sorry, Alan, I couldn't get the last word. I thought that there's a theory that Lee Oswald became Donald P. Norton. N-O-R-T-O-N. Oh, are you referring to the examining uh, of the body and examining of the physical evidence, of the, the, the cadaver? No, I don't know why I've seen it, but there was a theory that he later became known, he was given a new identity and he was called Donald Norton and he disappeared under that name. Yes, I, I know that John Armstrong has done some research on that, and I couldn't find enough corroboration to the book. In his research, he always tried to get corroborative evidence, so there needed to be two sources for anything mm -hmm. he was going to uh, claim. He did study did some research on that. And I believe on the Harvey and Lee site, a website, harveyandlee.com, run so nicely by uh, Jim Hargrove, that there is some information provided on Adonis. No, James, your, your, your audio is breaking up a little bit. Could you move a little bit closer to the microphone, please? Is that better? 
Much better. Much. Did you, did you um, Alan, was that satisfactory? Did you catch all of that answer? Yeah, that, that's fine. Yeah, okay. Um, I've, I've got a question then, uh, James. What, what happened to Lee when, when Harvey was in the Soviet Union for two and a half years? What, 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 where did he, do, what, did, what did he do? Well, we have evidence um, primarily coming from um, what I think is a fascinating eyewitness named Marita Lorenz, uh, who had met Lee Oswald in Florida at the time when Harvey was in the Soviet Union. He was called before the House Select Committee and gave evidence uh, that about Oswald that contradicted conflicted with the time in the Soviet Union. And so she was taken to task on that and uh, basically held a perjury uh, in that regard. Um, but it appears that Oswald was working, continuing to work for the CIA involved in anti-Castro activities in Florida uh, in 1961, 1962, uh, according to Marita Lorenz. And she's, she's the one that had the affair with Castro. That's right. Okay. Okay, this, I've, got a, I've got a question from, uh, from David. Um, where, oh, okay. <laughs> okay, actually, he's the same, it's the same question that I asked. It's okay. Um, it's exactly the same question. Um, is there anybody else? I've got a few more. James, uh, <clears throat> Gary, um, I, th I think I've mentioned to you the, the man in uh, St. Louis Park, suburban Minneapolis, uh, named uh, Morton Levine. And he was in the news about 15 years ago. And I uh, got the reporter at one of the local affiliates to, to give me his phone number. So I went to his house and uh, he was already in his 90s, I think, and <clears throat> legally blind. But his story was that he was in charge of defectors at the INS. And um, he received Oswald's request at the, at the INS office in DC to re-enter the US and he said, I wasn't gonna let him back in. He was uh, a defector, he was a traitor. And uh, he got two more requests and turned them both down. But each of the three times his higher ups in the office there in DC would come to him and say, uh, come on, Morton, let him back in. He says, I'm not going to, he's, he's a defector, he's a traitor. And the fourth time, his higher ups came to him and said, you will admit him. The State Department demands that he be allowed back in. Now, for me, the significance of that is that it wasn't a facile sort of uh, re-entry into the US. And the fact that the State Department overruled Morton Levine at INS, who was in charge of keeping track of the defectors, that they overruled him is even more of an indictment of the US government and the State Department in manipulating Oswald's identity. So it, it, Morton Levine is pretty obscure. Uh, I don't think he's mentioned any place uh, except any someplace I've mentioned it. Um, he didn't believe there was a conspiracy, believe it or not. <laughs> He, uh, he was just kind of naive, even though he was in a position at INS to, to seemingly know a whole lot about all defectors. And uh, I don't think it was a matter of any kind of senility. Uh, he died about, I don't know, eight years ago, I think. But the fact that the Minneapolis Tribune and a, one of the large network stations did a 10 minute profile on him, uh, you know, give some credibility to, to his story. I was surprised that they let me uh, 
get to him with information that uh, they had. That is a fascinating anecdote, Gary, and it, it raises the question of how on earth he, Oswald could have been let back in so easily after the defection, two and a half years spent in the Soviet Union, and he just waltzes right back home um, with no scrutiny at all. Yeah, ex except for Morton Levine, who was uh, ignored and suppressed. I spent about four days with uh, uh, Ernst Totovitz, as you know, in Dallas in 13. And uh, it's a long story, but he uh, in no way indicted Oswald for anything. I mean, they were best friends for two and a half years and it was nothing but uh, praise for Os Oswald and uh, sticking up for him. Um, it was uh, a very, you know, you spend four days with somebody like that at a conference, sitting next to him, taking him to the conference from our hotel, et cetera, uh, being at the uh, Egyptian lounge and at the moment, 50 years after the assassin, or 50 years after Oswald's death and see how he was processing the fact that his at one time best friend had been killed by people called the Egyptian lounge his home. He, he was very real and authentic um, in his interaction with me at that point and was very emotional, in fact. Uh, so, you know, whether he was interacting with Harvey or Lee, I haven't quite sorted out, but he, he didn't necessarily think there were two. Um, I think there was based on your extensive research and analysis of Armstrong, so. Fascinating. Thank you. James, I've got another question from David actually. Um, assuming that there was an Oswald that went to Mexico in September, was it, was it Lee? And if so, where was Harvey? Well, in my mind, the evidence that we have Sorry, we lost your, James, we lost your audio again there. The, based on the evidence, as far as I can tell, Oswald, neither one of them went to Mexico City. It is such an enormous red herring uh, that nothing definitively suggests that the one of them were there at that time. Specifically for Harvey Oswald, um, the trail of evidence points to him being in other places in that period. And it's just such a, a complicated topic that I think Edwin Lopez of the House Select Committee uh, perhaps said it best that despite it all, uh, they had to conclude that Oswald never went to Mexico City. Okay, um, David, thank you for that answer. That's good. Um, I've got a couple of more questions um, really regarding the whole plan and the whole project, if you like. Um, perhaps we could start with the Hungarian refugee, eight-year-old refugee. Um, why would he be fluent in Russian? Well, that's a very good question, Neil. The, the, basically, as these little kids in Eastern Europe... The sound is gone again. As, as children in Eastern Europe grew up in... Uh, in countries such as Poland and Hungary and Romania, uh, they would often be raised speaking Russian. Um, when, when I was teaching, I worked with a Holocaust survivor 
um, um, escaped escaped from one of the, uh, uh, the I asked him the question when you were growing up did you add that growing up in Poland uh, this would have been in the really the early 19 late uh, 30s and early 40s that uh, he was trained to speak Russian. So being bilingual was a very natural byproduct of living in that Eastern European uh, in, environment. Um, and so it, it, was, it was commonplace uh, for a lot of those immigrants to be bilingual. And especially, uh, I'll just say my girlfriend's Bulgarian and um, especially our post 45, where the, where the Soviets can basically controlled Eastern Europe and formed the Warsaw Pact and the rest of it. It was, um, it was I suppose, strongly encouraged that you also learnt um, Russian. That sounds the, about right. Because the controlling power in Eastern Europe. But um, I mean, he, sorry, so the claim is though that he came to uh, United States in 47 uh, as, as an eight year old. So the, the, the being taught Russian, I, I guess wouldn't have occurred until after 45 because the second world war was on. That, that would mean that he, he would have had as a young child, two years of being taught Russian or being influenced by people that were speaking Russian. Right. Didn't Marina Oswald say that when she first met Lee, that he spoke Russian very well, but with a strange accent that she couldn't quite uh, work out what it was. She said it was somewhere from one of the Baltic countries or something like that. She wasn't sure. Yeah. It sounds like it could have been Poland or Hungary. Hungary not being Baltic, but uh, you see what I mean. That's correct. What do you conclude from that? I think it's always problematic to try to conclude anything from what Marina Oswald said. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I think without a doubt, um, she knew that he spoke fluent Russian. I think her English was in all likelihood much better than she made it out to be. Uh, but it's difficult to, to conclude anything really expressly uh, from, from her word. Okay, just, just another couple of questions, you know, regarding the, the, the project side of it. Um, what was the point of placing um, Harvey in a, in a radio factory in Minsk? I mean, given the fact that there's obviously a lot of thought that's gone into this project and a lot of resources that's gone into this project, what's the end result for American intelligence by putting him into a factory in Minsk for two and a half years? What, what do they actually ultimately achieve out of that, the American agencies? Well, from the point of view of the American agencies, they had no control over where Oswald was going to be placed. Uh, they, they didn't know whether he would not be placed close to the Kremlin when so sending Oswald to Minsk was in some ways, I think on the part of the Soviets, an attempt to get him out of the way to sort of place him in an obscure location where he couldn't do any real, real damage. Uh, that's my take on it. And so we were taking all kinds of notes on um, a Russia, how a Russian factory operates. Uh, and he's making observations about Russian life and culture. But I think you raise an interesting point that it may not have been entirely fruitful as the mission that was originally intended as this long-term project. 
uh, since he was basically sent to this backwater in Minsk. Yeah, no, I was just thinking, I mean, it doesn't, I mean, if you were to score the, score the achievements of the project, at that point, you know, it doesn't feel like the, the end result was that great, really. Um, you know, what, what fantastic intelligence did they, did they end up with? <laughs> I, I do think it's instructive to read the notes that Oswald compiled uh, that gets at the heart of your question. Uh, mm -hmm. Because it, it does, does reveal a lot about Soviet life, about really how backward they are uh, insofar as creature comforts, how difficult it was, for example, to purchase a refrigerator, uh, get decent housing, uh, not the, even to mention the possibility of owning a car uh, all of those details are recorded in scrupulous detail. Um, it's an interesting uh, window into um, really how far behind uh, the Soviets were lagging uh, when compared to the affluence uh, in American life at that time. Yeah, well, that's fair enough, I think. Um, and the, the other question, again, in the same sort of area was, um, what was the point of, again, if, if, if this is a, you know, it's all being um, uh, you know, mastered by people above, what was the point of sending both Oswalds to Kittrell at the employment agency when clearly she saw them as two distinctly different individuals? Um, why would they? Why would they do that? That feels like a flaw, doesn't it, in the plan? I've thought a lot about that question, Neil. And one of the alternatives that I explored is that it was just an enormous coincidence. Uh, both of the men were going in looking for work, and it just so happened that they had to be sent to the same employment counselor. I think it was unlikely that that was something that was really intended. So it could have been an actual accident, a kind of quirk where the veil is lifted a little bit on the truth uh, because the two men were both um, seeking work, but it was not necessarily intended that they would see the same counselor who would then um, basically remember them both. Yeah, an unfortunate mistake perhaps, yeah. Um, again, in the same vein then as a supplementary question, I mean, the, the two Oswalds in the TSBD, I know that Armstrong, uh, you know, very much believes in that on the day of the assassination, but, uh, I haven't I haven't read the book, so you know, um, hands up there. But uh, uh, do, is the is the argument that both Os Oswalds were working at the TSBD for the five or six weeks ahead of the assassination, or is it just the day of the assassination that both Oswalds appear? Just the day of the assassination. Okay. Uh, we we do know. I think it's pretty clear that both. Oswalds leave the building and go in different directions. One leaves the building, gets on a bus, then changes to a taxi. Another Oswald leaves the building, goes out the front, goes down the, um, the grass area, gets in a Nash Rambler car and is driven away. We have that evidence uh, that really demonstrates that there were two, as one eyewitness actually uh, said of the guy leaving and getting in the Rambler, that had to have been the brother of Oswald if it wasn't Oswald himself. But we know the other one got on a bus in the other direction. Mm. Roger Craig, you mentioned the, we saw the guy coming down the slope into the Nash Rambler. Is it Roger Craig? 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I've got another couple of questions from David uh, James. Um, okay, this is a big one. Um, I'll just read it out. Is it all? Is it at all feasible that the whole documentary record could have been fabricated uh, ex post facto? Uh, in order to confuse the issue indefinitely? Well, that's an enormous question. <laughs> David, do you want to um, put your mic on and perhaps elaborate on, 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 on that? Can't hear you. Mic's off. My, mic's off, David. I can give a, sh a short answer. Um, if, if David, you're referring to the Warren report in this big midsection with 300 pages of the story of Oswald, that arguably is a fabrication right there. It is a bizarre melange and blending of the st stories of the two Oswald men. Uh, so I think you're on the right track to an idea, but I don't see how the entire story could be a fabrication because we just have so much eyewitness and documentary evidence. It just needs to be sorted out because in the Warren Commission, it's this enormous jumble. That's why we don't have any biographies of Oswald. Okay. I have a question, if I may. Uh, Oswald, whichever one it was, was arrested at the Texas Theater, and it's claimed that the police were led there by a trail from the Tippett murder scene. Uh, do you think that uh, one or the other Oswald was involved in that shooting? or that that is either a coincidence or something that was sort of a trail that was laid to uh, lead to an arrest of someone who hadn't done the shooting? Well, Michael, I think one of the key answers to your question lies in what we know about uh, Captain Westbrook. Um, there's an excellent article on the Harvey and Lee website about the activities of Westbrook um, right after the assassination. And he is the key figure who is marshalling the evidence and he's showing up at these spots. He's both at the murder scene at 10th and Patton and then he's in the Texas theater. Now, the, the trail of evidence leading to the Texas theater is rather murky, but- yes. It appears that somebody dropped off Harvey Oswald to the theater. And it is likely that he was escorted. He didn't, he didn't have time to walk from the rooming house. Um, and there's no record of him being on a bus. But a police car had driven by the rooming house and honked. And it, or to the Texas theater, the, the police officer, if it was Westbrook driving, uh, knew all about getting Oswald to the theater. The second Oswald then who had shot Tippett, Lee Oswald, was on his way, walked straight to the Texas theater and apparently went up to the balcony. So all of the circumstances of that are very complex, but I think some of the best research that's been done is into the very strange activities um, and just exactly what was known uh, by Captain Westbrook at the time. Hmm. Michael, is that helpful at all? I have no idea whether it's helpful or not, but it's interesting, thank you. Can I, can I add something? There's a strange tailpiece to this in that 
within a short time after the assassination, Westbrook, he left the DPD and joined the CIA and went to Vietnam. It seems an odd career move. I don't know how many senior police officers did that in Dallas, but I bet he's the only one. It looks like he was got out of the way. Now well, rewarded, depending on how you look at it. There's, there's, a, photo, there's a photograph, isn't there, of, of him with David Morales and another few other guys in the Far East. I, I, I think he went to South Korea, didn't he? It was Vietnam. Because he was... Um, he was liaising, wasn't he? Liaising with the police force. He had some kind of, he had some kind of liaison role, which is obviously a euphemism for a intelligence role. Yeah, but the thing was, I believe from what Ian Griggs said, that Westbrook's, he was working in sort of what we'd now call HR. He was working in sort of the personnel department of the DP of the DPD. So that's not intelligence work, is it? So why would the CIA recruit him, you know, and send him to Vietnam? It seems an odd move, but it looks like he was got out of the way. I, I think he was the one who planted the, wall the wallet at the Tippett murder scene. Mm. Very um, yeah, uh, Westbrook wasn't, um, he wasn't homicide. No. He was a uh, personnel. Correct. He had nothing to do with the murder investigation. And also, there was a reserve sergeant. Croy. Uh, Kenneth Croy. Sergeant Croy, who accompanied Westbrook um, to Tenth and Patton, where this uh, wallet was was discovered. There were also uh, other pieces of evidence that were not furnished to um, the homicide department, but ended up uh, delivered to the desk of Westbrook uh, personnel. Um, he also, Westbrook also, um, after the um, the shooting scene at 10th and Patton, uh, he ended up uh, discovering uh, the jacket, supposedly Oswald's jacket, that was found underneath uh, a parked vehicle in, in one of the, uh, um, was it a car sales? It was a Texaco, yeah. Texaco, yeah. Texaco station behind. Yeah. Uh, found the jacket and um, and the other interesting thing with um, suspected that Westbrook um, and Croy, Croy especially, was involved in the access of Jack Ruby to the uh, police basement on the Sunday because there were two Dallas officers that were um, that were stationed guarding doors, side entrances and what have you, who were dispatched off that um, job to do uh, traffic control uh, out in in Dallas, and uh, the replacement was none other than uh, Reserve Sergeant Croy, who uh, it's uh, shown by photographs escorted Jack Ruby. Uh, suspected, you know, I mean, the story is that he came down the. Uh, um, the entrance, the main, was it Main Street? The main entrance. Ramp. Down the ramp, which uh, was denied by the by the officer quite rightly. He, he didn't come in there, he was never seen there. Uh, but from the, um, from the Western Union office, 
if he came out of there, Ruby, he would have been seen out the window uh, by the uh, personnel office window. Uh, and uh, the arrangement was that Ruby came in through the side entrance. There was a side entrance there. And uh, that, that was uh, where Croy picked him up, walked him right to um, where uh, Oswald was going to be escorted out. It, and that's shown by photographs. It's not a theory. Uh, Sergeant Croy was stood uh, next to Jack Ruby. Uh, and of course, all that uh, would have then been um, able to give the green light to homicide uh, that everything was ready, set up to uh, finish the interview in the homicide office. And um, get Oswald down to the basement for the uh, for the other big event of the weekend. So, yeah, Westbrook and Croy are, are very suspicious uh, guys in the, uh, in, in the DPD, in the framing, certainly in the framing up of Oswald in the, um, as far as the uh, shooting of Tippett is concerned. I mean, obviously, you shoot a copper um, three or four times and then you drop your wallet and walk off, don't you? You know, it's crazy. And that's all I've got to say. Really. <laughs> that's enough. Yeah. Well, OK, um, we've got some other questions. Uh, David, again, um, this is uh, James. What's your view on... Um, the supposition that Oswald gave the Soviets details of U-2 flights, uh, sealing speed routes and so on. Is there any uh, evidence that uh, he was briefed by them? Neil, could you repeat the last part of that question? Yeah. Is, there, is there any evidence, do you have a view that whether Oswald gave the Soviets once he defected any details of the U-2 flights? No, not, none at all. Um, I've, I've read this very interesting book on um, uh, Robert Webster, uh, written by Gary Hill. And he um, has done some good research into uh, both Webster and Oswald and actually seems to lean toward uh, Webster being a genuine uh, defector. Uh, that's certainly not the case uh, with, with Oswald. There's, there's no indication of any secrets at all or was in any way related to the Gary Powers crash uh, that mm -hmm. So you, you broke up a little bit, so just get if you just come a little bit closer to your microphone, please. But uh, I did, we did get the we did get the answer. This one's a big one for you, um, from David. What's your view on the prayer man thesis? On the on the what thesis? Prayer man. Oh, wait, well, David, you're asking some tough questions. Uh, <laughs> I honestly. Um, I honestly do not believe that Oswald was outside at the time of the shooting. I believe he was just where he said he was uh, in, in the lunchroom uh, having his lunch and was inside uh, the building. And I, I think it's somewhat problematic to rely so heavily on photographic evidence I'm always interested in the photos, but I really, my main interest is focusing on eyewitness and documentary evidence. So I haven't given that much consider at all, consideration at all uh, to prayer man. 
uh, for a while, I was uh, uh, somewhat interested in the, the possibility of the, you know, it may have been Love Lady, it may have been Oswald in the corner, but I, I think it was Love Lady who was in the court, uh, corner as depicted in the Alkins photo. And again, pretty much have concluded that Oswald was exactly where he said he was, namely inside the building. So that would be Harvey in the lunchroom and, and Lee up on the sixth floor. That's the, that's the Armstrong theory, isn't it? Do you, um, just while we're on that for a second, do you um do you think it's plausible that that uh, Lee gets into the passenger lift through the um, the mechanism between the fifth and the sixth floor and then comes down in the passenger lift? Do you think that is a really plausible uh, escape route? I think the the elevator is a plausible escape route, but it's not the route that Lee took. Uh, because we he, we know that he passes through the office of one of the secretaries. Uh, her name escapes me right now, but uh, she testified he walked right through his off her office. He wasn't supposed to be there, and then he went out the back and exited through the side of the building, uh, not out the front. Uh, the the people who would have taken the passenger elevator if it was appropriately rigged would have walked right out the front of the building okay so that would have been other other um assassins or uh, spotters on the sixth right okay fair enough um just what about the what about the rooming house are you in the are you, are you in the camp that one of the oswalds lived at, at north beckley because um, obviously some researchers don't think he was there. Um, but do you, do you think that there was an Oswald that, li that lived there and which one was it? And where would the other one have been living? Well, Harvey was living at the Beckley apartment. Uh, he registered under the name of Lee, apparently. Uh, but we don't know where the other Oswald was, was residing at the time. Okay, fair enough. And uh, I mean, obviously, I mean, this, this, this whole, exp your explanation is all pre predicated on the, the Oswald project and the two Oswalds. Um, obviously there were multiple sightings um, over years, weeks, days, and so forth. Uh, and even on the same day. Um, do, have you found any evidence that some of these sightings may have been, for example, Crayford or, um, William Seymour, Roy Hargreaves, or um, Ivor um, Baganov, Baganov, I can't remember his name, Russian guy. Um, have you looked into uh, other ideas of, of, of him being set up? Uh, is there any evidence that, that these other, you know, imposters might have been in play? I certainly think it's possible the ones that interest me the most are the ones that have the most detail in their allegations and corroboration. Uh, something like the Sylvia Odio incident is one that seems to me so very credible uh, by way of the, the, uh, the testimony she provided uh, of an imposter coming to her house and pretending to be um, Oswald, spouting off about how much she hated Kennedy and uh, actually giving a portent of the assassination. Uh, I'm always on the lookout for those. And I want to make sure that there is enough detail in the evidence uh, that makes it uh, really Incredible. There are all kinds of really wild uh, allegations and uh, with the case that's been studied this month, I think one has to always be cautious in looking closely at the evidence. I mean, I, have, I haven't looked at the, I haven't read the book, as I said, but I mean, things like the Ralph Yates thing, the, uh, the, um, the gun place, uh, 
you know, the shooting range, um, getting the tickets for the show at the top oh. 10 was in the morning. Bolton uh, Ford dealership. Yeah, yeah, the one, yeah, the one that fasc fascinates me is the Albert Bogard and Jack Lawrence of the Lincoln Mercury dealership. That's a very peculiar story. So, so does, yeah, there's does, one with, a, with an antique shop as well. Mm -hmm. A guy and uh, his wife walk in with two children because um, previously it had been a gun shop or something and he's, he was after someone to do some, to fit a site to a an old Italian rifle. And the, the two women I think were in there said, oh no, it's moved or something a couple of years ago. So so does, does the Harvey and Lee perspective explain all of these individual ones that we've just brought up? More or less, uh, yes, all of them. Um, in terms of the Lincoln uh, Mercury dealership, Harvey Oswald did not even have a driver's license. So it, it couldn't have been him out driving at high speeds. Um, whether or not we can identify it as Lee um, is another, another question. I think it's likely that there were multiple impersonators at work here just because of the sheer volume of the number of incidents. James, is there any uh, evidence um, that the two Marguerites knew each other? The, the I don't know where I saw it, whether it was in an Armstrong or someplace else, that at Exchange Place in New Orleans, the two Marguerites shared a closet that had uh, clothes that were interchangeable. I don't know if that's the word, but had clothes for both Harvey and Lee. You re recall that? Uh, I do. I don't think we have any real hard evidence to suggest that they, they ever met face to face. Uh, but the whole identity of the Marguerite Oswald poster uh, is curious to me. Just who was this woman? Um, in my opinion, she likely spoke Rus the Russian language uh, because in one instance, uh, John interviewed um, a neighbor of hers in an apartment complex that heard her and the little boy speaking in a foreign language. Uh, this was a from Fort Worth. And so she heard them speaking um, together in some foreign language. Um, so the whole idea, I think, is a mystery. But you're right. There were instances in New Orleans where it's possible that they were uh, somehow in cahoots with each other, um, sharing, the, living in the same quarters, perhaps sharing clothes and so on. A good point about that. Thanks. I'm going to leave now for a birthday party. Thanks, James. It was great. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Gary. Gary. Hey, Gary. Thanks, Gary. Yeah, can I come in? Um, uh, James, you, you mentioned the Gary Hill book. Uh, what do you make? He, he puts in there that um, that Webster's address in Leningrad was in Marina Oswald's address book. What, what do you make of that? I think there's pretty convincing evidence that Marina was very active, uh, perhaps as part of uh, a honey trap experience um, at the beginning. Oh. KGB. And so the odds are just in, so insurmountable that she would possibly have contact with both Webster and Oswald, uh, that I think there's something going on there with, uh, with Marina and her, um, the way that she was being 
maneuvered and po possibly manipulated as well. I think it's it's highly plausible that uh, that that happened and that that's bona fide evidence. I agree because didn't Anthony Summers in Conspiracy make a note that that uh, when Marina was uh, I think uh, speaking to the FBI or something uh, early on in her interviews, she was explaining that when she first met Lee, he was doing something or other in Russia, which actually was uh, Webster's story, not- It was working at an American, it detected after working at an American exhibition, it was in Crossfire. Yes. Uh, in Crossfire. Moscow, which was Webster's story, not, not Oswald's. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so that wouldn't surprise me at all that uh, she would have his address in her book and confuse him with Oswald at a very early stage. Yes. Mm. James, uh, going back to something you said a bit earlier, you mentioned about Lee being seen in the car. I, I assume you're talking about the Carl Mather affair, are you? Alan, could you give me that again? I'm sure it's my hearing more than anything else. It could be my accent. Um, you talked about Lee. Lee was in a car after the Texas theater. I, I assume you mean the Carl Mather affair. Carl Mather. Yes, that's it. You think that was Lee in the car? An actual mayor of, of Dallas had identified him, was on the scene then. Um, yes, um, um, someone like that had. Is it Wes? Wes? Wes Wise. That's it. Well, it was, wasn't it? Wasn't it a mechanic called Pate? Right. At the right. T. White. There was a mechanic, and then he told the story to the future mayor. And that's yeah. how it picked up pace, if I remember. Guy, the guy that was sitting in the car park and sped off at breakneck speed. It was about, it was at the junction where El Chico's restaurant is. Correct. The thing is, though, nobody has ever worked out where Carl Mother fits in this. Had somebody stolen his car or? And he lent the car to somebody or but the, the thing that's strange is that he wouldn't speak to the FBI and they, they let him off. I didn't think you could walk away from the FBI like that, but he refused to speak to them and he only spoke to the SC at the HSCA if he was granted immunity. And you know, immunity from what? Somebody using your license plate? And he was he was Collins Radio, wasn't he? He was, yes. And and him him and his wife went to um, comfort Marie Tippett after the um, after allegedly, the, yeah, the murder, yeah. So it's all again, it's very curious, isn't it? But if all was if all that was true, he could have told that to the FBI, couldn't he? You know, if he was at Tippett's that afternoon, he, he couldn't have been sat in the car, could he? Or well, I suppose he could, but it would have been a tight thing. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Is there are, are there any other questions from the floor, guys? All I have to say, really, um, I I've read Harvey and Lee uh, quite a few years back. Um, it, it's amazing research, and, and James, you also uh, mentioned the, the CD that comes with it. Um, uh, full of interesting stuff, um, but I, I can't get my head around why, wh what the, 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 such a convoluted um, two Lees, two Marguerites and all this and um, to uh, going back to the early 1950s or even earlier maybe uh, that all this is is being 
set up and run by an intelligence agency um, to send somebody to the Soviet Union. Uh, and, and, you know, you mentioned about um, Lee's notes that he wrote in the, in the Soviet Union um, about how, you know, okay, the difficulty of getting a washing machine. I mean, <laughs> it just seems uh, a hell of a lot of, of preparation um, to find out such mediocre information or, or you know, um, his impression of life in, in the Soviet Union, which um, I'm, I'm damn sure CIA knew all, all this stuff anyway. Um, that, that, that's my uh, difficulty with all this. Uh, it seemed if you wanted somebody uh, trained up in Russian language to, to defect as a false defector, and they could have got somebody and, and uh, spent just 12 months uh, really cramming the Russian language in them and then shipping them over to uh, through Finland. I, you know, it, it's uh, like much of this case, it, it um, I end up with uh, sitting on the fence uh, of of things. Uh, it's not really a question. That is. <laughs> I think I know where you, when you, you're going. Where you're going is you're saying that it would be much easier not to go through all this tremendous project yeah, and yeah. find young kids, you know, that may. Uh, change as they grow into adolescence and that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Why don't you find somebody in the military, because uh, it was a marine defection, find somebody who's, who, who is fluent in Russian or can be made fluent in Russian and blah, blah, blah. I'm sure that's an often, that's an argument you've heard before, I'm sure, James. What, what, what's the response there? Well, my response is if we look at some of these Cold War EIA projects, uh, some of them are just so crazy uh, that it's almost mind boggling uh, to try to uh, think about them and reconstruct them in hindsight. Um, at the time, it was felt that this was a, a fight to the death. Um, we were going to do everything in our power to defeat the evil empire. And so there were all kinds of these projects uh, being floated by the CIA. Um, I think that it's possible that you're right. Maybe it was a monumental failure. It was a flop because Oswald got sent to Minsk. It wasn't what they had in mind. He wasn't able to eavesdrop on VIPs and get a lot of military information. Uh, but Nonetheless, I think that it's entirely plausible that the CIA could have conceived and hatched this plan uh, to carry out with the intent of getting someone who knew Russian so well that able to listen in on conversations and understand uh, things that were being said uh, that they didn't think he, he could uh, recognize. Yeah. Okay. And, and is, it, is it is it plausible that Oswald got cold feet before? Uh, was he was he supposed to perhaps be there for a longer term and uh, and truncated the uh, the defection by returning? Perhaps they had other plans in mind for him. Possible. I mean, presumably, James, they would have had contingencies in place. I mean, they just don't pick two kids as as the grand project. You would have thought that they would have had. A series of kids, possibly across the states, 
that they were doing something they were doing something similar with. I mean, I guess there would have been a lot of refugees coming out of Eastern Europe post-war. Well, there may have been other plans. I don't know. I think that's a good question. David, David's got some more questions, actually. Um, David, do you want me to just read them or uh, can you can you talk? OK, first question. Um, at the risk of defaulting into circular logic, does the more frequent occurrence of Lee Oswald imposter sighting suggest that the plan to kill JFK was gathering pace? I think that was occurring really starting in really picking up momentum after the American University address of JFK. That's when these sightings start to take place and the rooming of Oswald, especially in the summer of 1963 in New Orleans, picks up steam. Yeah, I mean, one of his one of David's supplementary questions was that, that you know, would Oswald have been brought back because the plan to assassinate Kennedy was, you know, given the green light. But he, when did he come back? 62, didn't he? Came back in, yeah, so that would have been way before the peace, peace uh, lecture at the university, David, to be fair. Um, and then there's another question here. Um, I'm not sure I fully understand what you're asking, David. It, it, isn't the mole hunt the more credible explanation? Are you talking about why he was sent into the Soviet Union? Because they, the CIA suspected they had a problem. OK, so that's the question. Um, James, do you think that uh, Oswald was sent there to try and find the mole? Possible. I think that Terry Hill's book uh, does a good job in getting into that uh, topic. Um, we just don't have any evidence to, to know for certain if what the specific objective might have been. It's a good question, though, David. Thank you. Does that complete your questions, David? Give me the thumbs up. <laughs> He's got a problem with his microphone. Okay, good. Well, is there is there anybody else that would like to ask anything? Well, the good news, um, James, is I think you, there may be a book sale. <laughs> we've got one, one of our members has uh, has asked because we've got a, we've got a whole bunch of um, Harvey and Lee's for for sale. Actually, um, I think came from when uh, Malcolm was doing research with John. Okay. And, and one of our one of our guest members today has uh, inquired about that. So it looks like um, you've convinced somebody to buy the book anyway. There have been a couple of inquiries actually. Oh, have you? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's a really interesting subject matter, um, James, and we're very grateful that uh, that um, you know you gave up your time today for us. Well, thank you. These were great questions. Thanks, guys. Yeah. All right, well, I, I guess I'll stop the recording now. Um.